Hey, I'm fading in from the cosmos here to tell you about Steve Longo. Now, this episode's going to be really fun. Steve Longo was the drummer for more than just John Entwistle. He's worked with ACDC. He's worked with a lot of really cool bands. He was in the band Rat Race Choir, helped form it. And I think you're going to enjoy this episode. We talk about the fore and aft, all of that era. We talk about Steve and his life, and we get to talk about John Entwistle and the rarities that have came out recently. And Volume 2 is coming soon. But this one is just about Volume 1 because it was recorded a while ago back. Remember, listen closely and learn something. Thing new. Hey everybody, this is your host Vinyl Man Jeb in video format here today with Steve Longo, who, man, Rat Race Choir, all these great bands. You got John Entwistle, he's worked with members of ACDC, I don't know where to even start. Steve, how are you? I'm good, man, how are you? Good, I'm loving the background. Uh, tell me a little bit about your show that you mentioned before we started here. Well, you know, it's, um, first of all, the I don't want to go to the gloom side of things, but when the uh, pandemic shut everything down, all of a sudden, all my musician friends are out of work and they're all online entertaining the frontline workers and doing this whole thing. And I said, well, you know, what can I do? And uh, I have a friend, guitar player in Zebra, Randy Jackson, called me up and he said, man, you should just talk to your friends because you'd be great at it. And it gave me a great idea. Because I, I mean, if you think of all the people that I know over the years, which is, I'm proud to say it's a good number. If I just called any one of them out of the blue and said, hey, man, it's Steve. How you doing? That would be incredibly weird. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Steve Stevens, how are you doing? Hey, you know, whatever. It would just, yeah. but, but to do it on a show and be able to reconnect with like all these guys from my past or my present or, you know, it's a it was a great platform for me. So we call it rock and roll show and tell. And it's exactly what we're doing here now. Only, you know, I have a guess. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, we'll put that down below for you. We'll link that down for the viewers as well. Get that going for them. Because, guys, check it out. It's rock and roll. Come on. <laughs> but I wanted to, uh, rock and roll. It's to get into rock. some of your early career. But I start off with the same question for everybody. Just to kind of keep everybody on the same ground. What got you into music, Steve? <sighs> um... <laughs> Well, it, I mean, it's a, it's kind of a, a there was always music. I, I don't ever remember there mm-hmm. not being music in my house. My first musical experience was my mother was a concert, you know, a, a classical pianist, not professional, but, but she was, a, you know, trained, took lessons as a kid and had a Steinway in uh, the foyer of the, of the house. And I used to sit on the pedals, right, so that all the sustain and everything is it's sustained, and then reach up over the keyboard and r- make the bottom keys rumble and listen to the soundboard. And <laughs> it was like, wow. It sounded like nothing I had ever heard. So, and like I said, there was always music in my house. But when I was in kindergarten, my mother told me that they were going to have an assembly at my school and that the high school band was coming with uh, this band leader, uh, Al, Al Renino Sr., who was, so the band was supposed to be incredible. So that was my first exposure to live mm. music in a room where you're hearing the ambience and it's like, why it doesn't sound like anything. <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the pipe was black and white and mono back then. So to hear that, it was incredible. And I turned to the girl next to me and I said, that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And <laughs> she remembers me walking around with a pair of drumsticks in my pocket throughout uh, primary school. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, and what what it became a great, great drummer that you are. And it's exciting to see how your career started. I'm going to start right from the beginning. Uh, You founded Rat Race Choir in 68, correct? 68. Well, what? Yeah. I mean, we had been playing. The music started long before that. The bass, the original bass player, actually the only bass player in Rat Race Choir and Mm -hmm. lead singer Dave Camella and I were childhood all the way back to I can't remember when friends. And Dave played accordion. And once I saw the stuff going on in my elementary school, I now played the drums. And our friend Jan, who wound up becoming our light guy, you know, years later, played trumpet. And so we called ourselves the Continentals. This is Mm pre-Beatles. And uh, and that was the first band thing that, you know, that was the first uh, band experience. Um, and then it, and so the bass player in that, or the accordion player in that band, wound up being the lead singer and bass player in Rat Race Choir. So we oh. just evolved into that, and you know we went through a number of members. We've had a, a couple of guitar players, a couple of keyboard players, 
but the nucleus of rat race really happened in i'm thinking it was 74 okay 74 when we got mark hit on guitar
guitaring is fantastic from the videos I've watched and you guys played at the fore and aft correct in uh, Brewster and uh, I believe White Plains White Plains as well I was trying to remember the two because yeah <laughs> oh, and there was another one uh, believe it or not in Westport Connecticut there was the fore oh, and wow. aft south in White Plains fore and aft north in Brewster and I guess it was the fore and aft west in Westport Connecticut wow. which there's some there's some amusing stories that go along with that place, but we actually yeah, ran like the a aft, whole series. We ran a the, whole series on the aft uh, for a little bit. I interviewed Rick Tedesco. Um, who else? Uh, Doug Wahlberg before he passed. Rest in peace on Doug. And I I got so enthralled because my dad used to tell me stories of the fore and aft when he was my age going there, and I was just like, I have to pick up on this, learn about it. I'm 23 now, so I'm trying to get all this history because that's what I like about rock and roll. But I know Entwistle's played there too, and we'll get to that in the uh, you know as we go on. But go on about any stories for the aft, definitely. Well, okay. <laughs> First of all, my brother was mm. uh, you know back we're talking about 60s well he was always eight years older than me no matter when it was but he was at the age when he was 18 i was 10 right and i had just found out about this music and i'm watching stuff on tv and i'm listening to my mother's records and uh got very influenced by a lot of eclectic stuff back then but the aft was my my brother would go there and it was like mm. this, i wasn't allowed to go there right i'm 10 years old i not a chance for me going to yeah. the end. But I would kind of hear these stories on the phone, or I, my mother would, ex, you know, express her displeasure with him going there, and so it was my, you know, as my rock and roll thing happened, you know, we're playing CYO dances and mm -hmm. we're playing here and this local place and this junior high school party and whatever. As that's evolving, I'm thinking to myself, man. I will. I know I made it when I play the four and a half <laughs> on East Coast Road, and it was my first. <laughs> it's true, and it was my first kind of fantasy about, you know, being a professional musician, a successful pro. That's what it was about. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I was so enthralled when uh, Mike, uh, this guy, uh, put on the four and a half fests in the IF Center. He did them for two years there, and I was coming to see everybody. And I got to meet the original Alice Cooper guys, which was amazing. Uh, Dennis and uh, Michael Bruce both signed my jacket. I'll, I'll show you at the end when we're done. I have a whole four and a half jacket signed by all the bands. And wow. I think Larry from Rat Race Choir, the, key, the keyboardist, signed my whole arm and wrote me this gigantic message. And I miss him dearly because it was such an experience to meet him and just some Something so cool for all that to happen and, and jimmy was there from sapphire just so many great bands and uh got to know everybody so it's great that we're connecting and everything too as well to continue sure, the sure. four and a half legacy after you know it's gone so <laughs> well the thing that you know larry uh, mm -hmm. for the for the 10 how most halcyon years of of rat race which you know would be 69 to 79 mm -hmm. That was Larry's time in the band. And Larry and I were like the best of friends. It mm -hmm. was like Butch and Sundance or whatever. And we got up to all kinds of craziness. I, I, I'll give you one example. Sure. Um, the, the bass player was a senior. Larry was a junior. And I was coming in to be a sophomore at our high school in White Plain. And Larry, good boy that he was, loved by all, 
worked in the office. So he manipulated things. He worked, you know, he didn't have to go to mm. home. Really. He got to hang out in the office with the computer and whatever else. <laughs> so he manipulated his classes so that he was no longer a junior. He was now a sophomore. So he could be in all of my classes and we could like hang out. And I said, but Larry, we're just going to skip class anyway. Do you want? He said, well, yeah, but this way we don't have to look for each other. Well, that's uh that's how that friendship started that's awesome uh, we had a great time we uh we just had a great time so we'll move on to the next question for you you have worked with many musicians from the likes of joe walsh brian johnson of acdc all the way to todd rudgren do you have any fond memories with any of these i mean these are great names but any in particular probably all of them but <laughs> i have fond memories with all, 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 oh, i'll yeah. tell you I, I have a quick joe walsh story sure um uh, we were at the China Club and and at the China Club in New York back in that, you know, in that time period, there was the jam was off the hook. I mean, there was the celebrity pro jam on Monday night. So Joe's there. The Uptown Horns are there. Oh, wow. I think maybe Bruce Willis was there. There's a bunch of notable guitar players. I'm sure Ray Gomez and, you know, just a just a, a list of who's who players. And Joe, this is before sobriety. Joe is wearing this suit that's all flowers and colors oh, and he is so so drunk that mm -hmm. i don't know how he's gonna stand up and he starts he starts huddling everybody in the office right because that's where that was the hang you know the to get away even from the vip section he says come on let's go play some music and <laughs> and and we're grabbing people out of the audience or not the audience out of the crowd as we're heading towards the stage and we go up on the stage and everybody's together gerardo velez who played with hendrix is on percussion i'm playing drums i told you we had the horns mm -hmm. and I, just a ridiculous band and joe's out in front and he calls out, she's about a mover. Now, I don't know if you know that song or not. Look it up and drop it in. Sure, she's yeah, I'll drop it in. Mover. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that song. Right. Yeah. And I'm saying to myself, really? <laughs> you know, because I'm not a drinker myself because um, I can't play drums and drink. So if mm -hmm. I can't do it and drink, I'm, you know, drums win all the time. And um, so... I'm thinking, how is he going to keep this patient groove? And I'm telling you, every cell in that body had to be focused on playing guitar because the guy was so amazing. <sighs> just to, I, the feel, I just, I couldn't even imagine being that. And then in the, in the middle of the song, he says, all right, now everybody play lead, and everybody, all the sax players, everybody starts playing <laughs> lead. It was fantastic. But that's Joe's, awesome. Yeah, he's cool. And so, segue to end whistle from Joe because mm -hmm. that's you know Joe played with John. Too late, the hero, of course. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. And um, you know that was a real. I'm surprised more didn't come out of that friendship with him and Joe Vitale. Uh, because it seemed like a, a real, but I think timing is everything. And if you're not ready for one reason or another, um, then you wind up not seizing those opportunities. But that probably would have been a great, you know, ongoing project. Uh, I'm sure, you know, not that I have any complaints that it didn't happen. Yeah. I knew John like 15 years almost to the hour. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot in that time. Um, and, but it was all based on fun. It was all based on, you know, there was no pressure to sell out a venue because we were on tour with 800 people in the crew. Yeah. You know, it was just, let's go out and play in a rock band and be that when, you know, and John never let his celebrity stand in the way of his ability to enjoy it on you know a very primary level well, that's amazing I, always, wow. I found that that to be one of the coolest things that you know he it's not that he wanted to deny it he just didn't want it to make a difference because he wanted to go out to breakfast he wanted to mm -hmm. you know let's go to and watch check out dodge uh city in kansas down where they had the gunfights you know, and you can't do that if you're, you know, taking a private job, whatever. So yeah, I got you. He was very accessible and he was very accessible to his fans. That's, I think, what he liked the most about it was, you know, when you're playing in a band like The Who, yeah. there's not, especially back then, 
there were no meet and greets. There was, you know, there no. was, there was, but the opportunities were just not there to me. And John loved the fans. He would hold the court in the hotel bar until they threw him out. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, I wish I got to have met him, but I was too young, you know, just timing and everything. Cause he's one of my, one of my major heroes in rock music altogether. I mean, if I, any super group I ever think of, I got Keith Moon and John Entwistle as the rhythm section, you know, right there. Cause you can't really move from that. I mean, everybody, you know, Neil Port with the argument of Keith, you know, the whole rock arguments, but I would, that's my, you can't separate the two. Sometimes they're just such a good backing for any band, you know, and just amazing stuff. Uh, but how did you come to meet with John Entwistle? How did this all work out for you to become his drummer? Um, um, a friend of ours, mm -hmm. uh, Joe Berger, was the front of house sound man for several different bands in the tri-state area in New York, and also a phenomenal guitarist. And he went to all the trade shows, you know, and, and he would do demos. If you've uh, have you been to Nam yet? Have you done that yet? Not yet. No, I want to go gotta so do, bad. <laughs> got to do Nam, no, and right. somebody will hook you up with a badge, and you'll be in good shape. But um, that it's and but wait till it normalizes because I sure. don't think it's still not right yet. So I get invited um, to do my first Nam show, and Joe has been at Music Mesa, which is the Nam show in Germany. I think it happened oh, in wow. March, and he went and played with uh, Ant Whistle, and I don't even know. <laughs> know all the guys that he played with there because john just he just wants to jam you know <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to show him a resume if you can play let's go i'll see oh, you that's in. awesome so, wow so joe came back and i went in to see joe in the city because he was our engineer did a bunch of stuff for us in the studio you know, it was a, just an ongoing friendship and he tells me, yeah, I just played with uh, Jack Bruce and John Ellisle. And I said, not at the same, not at the same time. And he said, no, no, no. Um, and I said, well, how can we get to play with John Entwistle? And he said, I'll tell you what. I'll get in touch with him, and I'll see if he's coming to NAMM in Chicago. And if he is, I'll set it up. Well, John, at that period of his life, 85 to 90 something he was the man i mean he loved nam because you just got to walk on the floor if you didn't want to be bothered you could not be bothered because there was always a place to go but you really got to meet the people that were you know appreciating your music and and wow. um yeah and he was i'm telling you it was it was it was great to see him do that and he handled it it's not like there were um you know mad rushes of craziness <laughs> it, it was you know it was a controlled explosion and he uh he he loved it he really did he he um and so anyway to come back to the story um i uh sorry i'm getting no worries the evil phone <laughs> i know phone. i had to shut mine off while you were talking i was like <laughs> just making sure it's off uh. well. Uh, yeah, I would have thrown mine across the room, but I know you have an editor. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <That's the> best part. <laughs> so sure enough, we're at the we're at McCormick Place in Chicago, and there Joe says, you know, meet us out in front, meet me out in front of uh, the main entrance at two o'clock. And so we went there, me and uh, the keyboard player, not Larry, but the mm -hmm. actually keyboard player twice removed. Um, Anyway, uh, Jack Hotop and Mark was there and Dave was there and I was there and up comes Joe with John Entwistle. It was like, it was like somebody, you know. And John is all dressed in his dress. You know, he, he dresses like that every day. That's awesome. You know, the spider and the shirt and the jacket mm. and the boots and the jeans. And it's, you know, I mean, it's a look. And you, when you see it coming on an empty street in Chicago, it's like, <laughs> okay. And uh, he came and Joe introduced us. And I said to him, uh, you want to jam? And he said, anytime. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> I can make that happen. So I went on the NAM floor. Um, we actually uh, did a trio jam, me, him, and Mark at the limelight. But I went on to the NAM floor. You know, everybody, there's always a big jam at NAM. That's the thing. If you can get Oh, it, wow. To the jams it, that's where it's at and in this day it was guys like eddie van halen and leslie <laughs> Webb and dweezil zappa and oh, the, <laughs> the M. Steven, you know and, and because the brand was kramer that was the guitar that oh okay eddie had, yeah, eddie had 
just, you know, taking that thing over the top. So they were the premier show. And I went to the Kramer booth and I said, uh, hi, I'm playing with John Ellis. And we'd like to, we'd like to, <laughs> we'd like to jam. And they said, okay, well, John Ellison, no problem. They make room. Neil Schoen got pushed back. Somebody oh. else got pushed forward. And John has no idea. And so I said, uh, I said, okay, great. You know, and they said, all right, well, we'll send a car for you, for me, right? I'm staying at, a, at like the last minute hotel or motel in Chicago because if you don't book your accommodations like yeah. that, Eight months in advance so i'm playing at i'm i'm staying at like the cracker box in and the limo that shows up is bigger than the place i'm staying <laughs> that's awesome so i said okay this is gonna be fun so i get in the car right and i i mean then this is what it was a stupid limo there's limos and then there's a stupid one so <laughs> really stupid. and we went down to the drake which is where john was staying and i rang him up and i said uh, we're downstairs and he said okay Okay, mate, I'll be down in a minute. And him, and I think it was Andy was his tech at the time, come walking down. He's, you know, wearing the clothes. He's got the, you know, the spider and the whole nine yards. And Andy's carrying this giant case with his buzzard in it. And he looks at me, and he looks at the limo driver standing there with the door open. He has no idea who I am. He's only heard Joe Berger rave about our band. And so he thinks, you know, this is my limo. (laughs) <laughs> and he gets in and Andy puts the thing in the trunk and he gets in the jump seat and we drive, you know, across town to the Vic Theater, which is like this beautiful. Yeah. Theater, oh, wow. Right? And uh, and we get hustled down into the dressing rooms, down this back staircase. We're going down an alley. It's not like we're hanging out the window looking around. <laughs> you know, it's dark. We're blacked out windows. And and so John still doesn't have any idea where we are. We could come out and be playing at the, you know, the wino winery or whatever. So we're in the dressing room and he says, what are we going to play? And I said, we'll play who songs? And he said, I don't know any. <laughs> I said, well, we'll teach them to you. And the rest of the guys in the band show up and blah, blah, blah. And we decide on the four songs that we're going to play. And when he said, you guys even learned the mistakes. <laughs> so we said, well, we made them, we learned them. And we went on and there's actually video of that night. And we played, uh, summertime blues and a extended version of something from Tommy. Oh, wow. Uh, See me, feel me. And, um, we ended with won't get fooled again. And that's how it started because he was like, Joe Berger said to me, which I, I, I find incredible that John came up to him after we played and said, did you just see God? Now, I'm not sure what their relationship was back then. But Joe wound up doing uh, front of house for us. It's a story that he tells. And so, you know, and and John and I just became friends. You know, we oh, were awesome. like-minded. And, you know, it was just that we were uh, trading jokes. And it just, he gave me his number, which is, you know, it was the first time I had ever seen a number this long.
71, I'm maybe 19, 18, 19, and the first solo album comes out. And mm -hmm. I think it was Roller Skate Kate and so on and so forth. Now realize yeah. that, that the thing that I was drawn to by the Who was the ferocity of the rhythm section. I mean, Pete, yeah, go ahead, jump around, play the big power chords, but these guys are getting paid. This is music by the note. I mean, these guys are getting play, paid by the note, and they're just <laughs> having it's just going back and forth forever. And I, that's what I I couldn't wait for John's solo <laughs> album. And when it wasn't that, I was like, oh. I see what you're saying, yeah. And I was, you know, so I, you know, and I was in the, height of my musical journey you know hendrix was looming big in my life and um you know, then i started to get into Prague, gentle giant uh uk mm -hmm. whatever and 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 it evolved out and then when i so when i met john um i kind of fell off with the who um not that i fell off with them i got you I, yeah. you know after keith died and that whole thing happened it was just you know i started looking in another place it wasn't that i didn't believe or love because tommy and live at leeds are two of the most influential albums yeah you know rock albums in my life so but i just started you know i was on a journey of my own and so um so i kind of lost touch with what they were doing mm -hmm. when something great came out and you heard it you know it was uh, eminence front or whatever it was like yeah. you know and uh but um so when i started playing with john john was all about moving forward i was all about moving forward the reason that i was always on the search for um musicians like is i wanted to push the boundaries i wanted to write music i wanted to make a contribution and that's the way john was he felt that he was under I don't want to say underused, but the who was not um, enough of an outlet for his original material, which is why mm -hmm. he was doing solo albums in the first place. So, I mean, together we, we formed a partnership very early on. Um, and it was more than just, you know, I was his drummer or whatever it was. It was we were trying to accomplish something long term because his one of his complaints about about touring was he didn't get to do enough of it mm. that's why he wrote endless vacation nobody told me life up here was an endless vacation and um i mean the guy wanted to play when you're that freaking good yeah. you know if, uh, if i could make a lamp disappear i'd be going to everybody's party saying hey watch yeah. this look what i could do <laughs> right I'd be, I, if i didn't even know you and i saw your door open i'd come and say hey check this out yeah, because right? it's, so, it's such a cool power, yeah. yeah. So, you know, why wouldn't you want to get out there? And one of the things that John liked about playing live um, in his own band was that he got to see, he got to look the fans in the eye. And when they're standing there, like, <laughs> he loved that. And then he loved, you know, if he could show them his bass or let them see something that they wouldn't ever get a chance to see. He was... Uh, amazing that way they say uh it was said that he would play at the opening of an envelope if his fans were there so. wow <laughs> wow <laughs> i would love to now start opening letters and be like hey i'm gonna go back in a time machine and just start opening you know yeah i wish i, I really got to see him because just so much i hear a lot about him and as my history of rock and roll search keeps going as i'm kind of absorbing this as a mm -hmm. as a young fellow in the music industry myself i run a record label and i run a radio show as well so i'm i'm on all the fronts because now we can do that with the power of the internet and everything which yeah. is amazing you know it has its good stuff and the good stuff i think is setting up these podcasts and being able to talk with musicians such as yourself <laughs> without question i mean and i'll tell you what john and i were together at the beginning of all of this you mm -hmm. know we were um as far as we could get we couldn't transfer digital audio but we had identical midi studios in our our house our houses in in, in mm -hmm. his estate and my house um <laughs> but the uh, ge the gear was the same and we had it wasn't even uh cable yet it was still dial up 288 right i mean hello that's okay but we were able to send midi files back and forth which were are tiny just you know yeah tiny little file, and then decode them on the other end he would get exactly what i played because he wow. would 
decode it with the instruments and then send it back to me. And we had this whole amazing thing that we were wanting to do. And we wound up doing the first online jam from one of the NAM shows in oh, wow. uh, the early 90s. And it was just amazing. He was all about tomorrow. And if you asked him, out of all those bases that you were talking about, mm. if you asked him what his, his favorite bass was, he would tell you the one I'm playing tonight. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. Cause it just didn't define him. It didn't say, okay, I always play this one. He was like, I like that. Cause I'm, I'm young and I have the, my brain, cause I make music too. My brain seems to always want to function and just go, 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 go. And when I try to rest, I can't, I'm always, you know, so I've always, I think that's the music bug. They tell, you know, any creativity bug type thing. Uh, but I noticed that I've always was angry with it or annoyed by it. And as I got older, I was like, no, I'm not annoyed. I can make great music. I can play live. I can book bands on shows. I can do my record label with a team, run the radio show with our editor and run all this stuff. I'm not annoyed <laughs> anymore. You know, I'm happy to be able to do this. So it's great to hear that John Entwistle was always looking for kind of the, the future because that's an awesome thing as you look up to these guys, you know. One of the things that we wanted to do in the, in the solo band mm -hmm. was I, I had an eye, you know, we, our logos, for lack of a better word, was the buzzard, which you see hanging out on yeah. the tree. And that was taken off of his buzzard base that he designed with Warwick and then Status. And um, I said, we should have, you know, on the tour bus, we should have buzzard cam. Ooh. And, and yeah, but the technology, we would have had to buy mm. satellite uplink and I was trying to get Intel to underwrite it. And I mean, so believe me, I, I know what it's like to be a man of many hats. Mm. And, uh, you know, I thought it would have been great if everybody understood that the front lounge of the bus was always going to be live. So if you went up there, you had to be willing to be on camera. It would oh, just be cool. It's so interesting. Yeah. Fun. Because fans in Germany and another time zone would be able to look in and see, you know, cause you could catch John at any time. I mean, yeah. and and we really wanted to do that. We thought it would be fun to connect with the fans and, you know, the technology just wasn't there. But it was, you know. And now, nowadays it's like too much live stream. And now, now it's like, it's so common with the phones. I mean, it's crazy that these phones now have microphones in them that sound better than some of our studio equipment. Cause like I use, I got my sure SM for my recording stuff when I do vocals, but I also got the Yeti microphone for the radio show. You know, you got all these mics and then the mic on your phone is like insane. It's like, what happened here? You know, well, somebody told somebody, one of my guests on, mm -hmm. on my live stream, um, so it was one of the there's a lot of tribute bands and i i'm thinking it was the the one the journey um okay uh a journey tribute uh if my producer was here she would keep me on track but was it a band called voyage by any chance yes yes, yes yes saw them. okay cool and yeah he, wait a minute so hang on let me let me get sure. these synapses <laughs> on fire um his name began with a V. Come on, Steve. You can is, do is it. Is it Hugo? Is Hugo? Is that yes, the league? Right. There, there we go. Hugo, <laughs> Hugo Valenti. That's, that's where right. I got to yep. from. All right. You see, between us, I'm going to need that brain cell back, though. Sure. Um, <laughs> there you go. Uh, he played a track where his voice sounded so, it was so fantastically produced mm -hmm. and so perfect for the track. And I said to him, Man, because, you know, I have a studio and I like to think of, you know, different mics for different things. And I said, I, where did you do that vocal? And he said, believe it or not, I sang it into my iPhone. And I was like, wow. <laughs> and it, but it was I'm, the compression and the, you know, I'm sure that they did, you know, some EQ and, yeah. and on it here or there. But it was remarkable. I mean, I asked him about the vocal because there was it was so dynamic. I uh, but I love Texie. I came from mm. black and white TVs and AM radio to where we are now. What a blast of a journey it's been because I love what you know. I, I yeah, do. And I, my dad's the same way. was always looking for the future too, which is why I think it led into what I, well, how I am, but I'm always excited when new things happen. Like I'll jump on, you know, they have TikTok now and all that. And I started like putting the radio show on there. I'm like, if their people are listening and they, I want to tell a story, I'm going to put it where the story could be told. I don't, you know, I don't, you know, I don't go on there all the time, but I throw a story out there. I do radio dramas. I make uh, like war of the worlds type radio dramas for modern day. And that's now it's just movie soundtracks for your ears. 
years. It's what Zappa would have tried to have done, you know, but it's just so much fun. And then bringing the podcast and doing all this stuff, I never regretted it. And I, a lot of people my age, like, I wish I lived in a different generation. I'm pretty happy where I am right now. It just took a while to appreciate it that right now I can talk to all these people that I grew up with, you know, as a young kid that are ready to tell a story. And I don't want to jeopardize that and go live in a different time period. I'm pretty happy. <laughs> well, you, you know, listen, you know, my, my dad, uh, told me the secret to happiness is accept what you get, mm. not settle for what you get, but accept what you get. And, you know, I've written a lot of songs over the years with that theme in mind. And, you know, the, the happiness is a choice mm. and, you know, you can choose to be happy where you are, or you can choose to think you'll be happy when you get somewhere else. Uh, you know, for me, as long as I'm able to play music and do what I love, which I'm blessed to do for my whole life, I've never done anything else. It's hard to stay in a, in a negative space very long. Uh, you know, the rigors of the road can put you there, but mm -hmm. it's, you're still, you know what? I mean, you could be up on a roof in Florida uh, banging shingles at noon on a 99 degree day. So it's not so bad. Yeah, everything. I think everything. I'm always lived by the. I, I meditate a lot, and I'm I'm very much following that George Harrison lifestyle. Just to kind of it, you you stop getting angry at things that you used to get angry at, and you just let it go. And a lot of people tell me because I'm I'm young, and I always I always to be frustrated by it. Like people come up and be like, "Oh, you're only 23, and you do all this stuff," or at the time 20. And then I'm like, "Why am I frustrated? This is amazing." Because in another 10 years, I out I outrun a lot of the people that have said, "Oh, you started earlier than me," you know. So I learned a lot as to acceptance is who I am. And, and I write as well, write a lot of music too. So it's been a way to get through all of it. Uh, do you ever find yourself uh, needing to take breaks at times to like get away from burnout or any of that kind of stuff? Um, well, the, uh, the answer is, did I ever need to get away from burnout? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I don't think I ever had. Well, all right. We I developed a ritual later when I, when mm -hmm. I stopped Rat Race t played every day forever. That's really wow. what that was. That was like, let's play, every, you know, <laughs> let's play 22 shows in three weeks. Let's do, you know, and, and we were, we didn't care. We were, we were young and strong and yeah. crazy and, and having the time of our lives. So we played every day, almost every day. The only day we didn't play was on Monday sometimes because there was no place to play. Mm -hmm. um, and I used to be pacing back and forth in my room. Want, you know, I'm still living with my mother and I'm pacing back and forth, in my, you know, like a, like when does tomorrow <laughs> so I can go play. I'm the same way. That's crazy. Mm. So, but I, I mean, I did that. I, the, 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 good part was you know the 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 universe let me do it uh, with a band that you know i mean for decades we were out there you know slugging it out from 68 to 88 uh, you know there those were you know that was probably the beginning and and the tail off as far as you know the ridiculousness of packing clubs out to the street and that whole thing um and then the you know there are a lot of stuff factored into that drinking age changed yeah um, you know, but, uh, but yeah, the, it was, um, I guess I should have taken breaks, but I don't think we wanted to, but later in life, when I started doing tours that were months long mm -hmm. instead of, you know, forever, and then you had time off or you were going to write or do whatever, I got into a rhythm of every time I would get off of a tour, I would get my wife and my dog, we get in our car and drive down here to florida from new york to wow. go out to Sanibel island just to just soak it all off and it was and it was amazing you know and uh, you didn't want to leave but you had to leave because you can't stay there forever no. so finally <laughs> you know, when when life allowed me to move down here and believe me if you saw what happened to Sanibel with this hurricane oh yeah I wouldn't want to live there now, but I live maybe 12 miles away and, oh, wow. uh, you know, uh, and it's paradise for me.
we were doing a, a, a press tour for the release of uh, Vampires, the TV hmm. show. And, the, you know, I don't know if you if you know about that, but it's okay. out there. It's V-A-N hyphen P-I-R-E-S. It was a kid's show that John and I were the musical supervisors on, and we wrote a lot of the music for it. It's a, it's a whole big long wow. thing part of the a part of the a promotion for that show and for that music was we went to universal we had lunch in the commissary and you know there was a, a photographer with us and um somebody one of the exact i can't remember the guy's name and he's probably passed away by now but uh he was taking us around the lot and we were getting the vip tour from this old school hollywood executive i mean just <laughs> one of the coolest old school guys you know, the original OG, right? The OG yeah. OG. <laughs> and um, it was amazing. I saw him do one of the most amazing things. Uh, somebody came up to us, we're eating lunch in the commissary, and somebody comes up to him and says, hey, uh, how are you doing? And he said, blah, blah, blah. I said, all right. And he takes a card, watch closely now, takes a card out of his pocket, right? And he mm -hmm. pulls it out and he hands it to the guy. And the keyboard player says, wow, I'd like a card, please. And he said, you know, I mean, let's put the guy on the spot. And the guy said, okay. And he handed him the card from the other pocket. It was one oh, of the yeah. slickest things I've ever seen, ever. <laughs> it was like, here's a real card, and here's the card for you. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. He said, Would you, are you interested in, in Star Trek, which John was a major Star Trek mm -hmm. fan. I was, you know, I mean, we've done, we've, been through that he said because they're filming two television shows and a movie in the same wow. in the same building and so they were filming deep space nine that the one oh, with wow. um, that the one with uh, seven of nine um I'm trying to think if that's deep no that's um i know which one that is hold on one second i'm gonna look it up jerry so ryan it. yeah jerry ryan yeah because they just wa I've been watching her in the new. They have a new series out with Picard, and it's amazing. It's like picks up where Next Generation was, but the uh, it's uh, from. Oh, give you one sec. Um, I should. It's Voyager, I think. I think it's Voyager. Oh, for, yeah, it could be Voyager. Yeah. Okay, so we're yeah, on the Voyager. set. There we go. <laughs> we're on the set of Voyager, outside of it, Neelix was the cook, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay, and we had, and he used to make stuff in those stone. They looked like stone bowls, which were like they were plastic or styrofoam, or whatever they were. Oh, so wow. we're on the set, and we're walking through the different places. And Jerry Ryan comes out, and she's wearing a robe because she's between takes. And Anson Williams was directing the episode, but she's got the thing right. And the guitar yeah. player, says, oh, you got something on your face, and she goes, "Oh no, don't embarrass me." And <laughs> she was pretty cool. So then they take us to Janeway's cabin, right? They take us into the sick bay. And so they took, I was scanning John with the oh. playing on the table and I'm scanning him with the thing. But then we <laughs> went into Janeway's cabin, right? And you know how they have those windows that they kind of go out like this, kind of like my yeah. window? Well, if I was on the other side of this, everything on the other side of this is just raw wood. It's wow. you're not really an outer space, but yeah. I mean, really, if you leaned on the window, you could get a splinter. So I said, guys, let's go outside and pretend we're floating in space and get our pictures taken like we're out in space outside of Janeway's cabin. John goes, ah, ha, ha, that'd be fun. And we go out there and the space was, you know, the actual space that's behind hmm. like my space is not, it's there, but it's twinkling. Yeah. The space is a, is a, um, it's a velvet curtain with little snips of tin on it and lights, and it moves like so slowly, it's unbelievable. Wow. And we're out there between the cabin and, and space, and John going after his nose like this, and he looks around and rub, <laughs> rubs it on the curtain and says, you don't think they'll, they'll mind another planet, do you? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Forever, forever the prankster.
Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video you just watched. I'm your host, Vinyl Man Jeb of Unlikely Places, Pop and Rock Radio Show here on YouTube and more places as well, Anchor too. Please subscribe to the channel if you really enjoyed it. Send us a like and leave a comment. It's the only way it kind of keeps it in the rotation. We really need the support to get those numbers up because that helps us help you get these great guests and great podcasts your way. As always, I'll see you next time. Signing off, Vinyl Man Jeb.